What if your next team workshop delivered the results you hoped for? What if everyone believed that the working session was a valuable use of their time and felt inspired to take action? My name is Miriam Happness, and it is my mission to help you to deliver workshops that work. Today with me on this show is Daniel Stillman. He's a conversation designer and the host of one of my favorite podcasts, The Conversation Factory. So today I'm looking forward to pick his brain and to talk about, surprise, conversation design. So stay tuned. Hello, Daniel. Hey, Miriam. I'm so excited to have you on my show. Thank you. It's a real pleasure. Yeah, to find. I like our pre-conversation. Our pre-conversation was great. Yes, it was, and thank you for the having taken time for that one as well. Yeah, I always enjoy to feel a little bit into it and um, to see how the conversation could flow. And while listening to your show, yeah, I guess every week I realized that there's so much more that I would like to hear from your side. So I was curious to get you on the other side of the mic, so to speak, and to pick your brain. So maybe we can start with just your story, because if I'm not mistaken, you started with a bachelor in physics. I did. And then you went into design, and now you're a facilitator and book author yeah. and podcast host. That's How my whole story. Happen? You nailed it. <laughs> That's it. That's the whole story. I mean, I guess for me, I, I mean, I do a lot of um, training as part of my work still. And if I draw the through line back, I definitely was always interested in teaching and learning myself, learning and teaching. And when I got into design, it was, I went to design school mainly because I, I thought I wanted to do museum exhibit design mm. work um, because I, I have my background in science And mm -hmm. I was like, well, what do I do with science? Because like I was having a hard time, you know, navigating that question. You're out of college and you're like, what do I, what do, I do? How do mm -hmm. I add value? And most of the jobs I had after college were sort of in the work of translating between disciplines. So like one of my mm -hmm. first jobs was helping manage a group of PhDs who were trying to find emerging technologies. And what I did was go and talk to people on various innovation boards at various universities and find emerging technologies. Because I knew enough biology, chemistry, and physics to search the relevant databases, mm -hmm. and they didn't know how to do that. The job I had right before going to design school was at the Museum of Natural History. I took that job thinking, like, I'll get closer to this idea that I was starting to develop in my head of doing something creative and technical, mm -hmm. um, which was something I was, was interested in doing. And... When I got to the museum, I realized that being hired from inside, like going from this research lab that I was mm -hmm. managing to like the exhibit design department was not going to happen. And I went and I talked to some people in exhibit design. They're like, well, yeah, you need a design background to do this job. You can't just have the science part. The science part is actually done by the curators, the person who is very high up in the chain. They're the ones who actually like say what's going to be in the exhibit. What we need mm -hmm. is people. Side. So that was like my first realization that there were multiple stakeholders <laughs> behind creating something complicated and that there were like power dynamics and who got to say what. And, and so when I realized that exhibit design was a thing and that the school I went to, Pratt, had a studio in it, that was like, I remember this guy saying this. He's like, if you go to Pratt, you can learn how to be a designer and you can do the studio. And when I did my studio in exhibit design, I realized that exhibit design was this and I'm sorry for any exhibit designers listening to this, but museums are really big and slow moving. Mm -hmm. And Public the, service, right? yeah, exactly. And so, and I realized it was like, oh, it was so political and it was so ossified that I just was like, oh, wow, this doesn't seem like there's going to be room for me to grow here. Mm -hmm. Whereas like I did studios that were more about human centered design. We didn't call it that. It was, that was just sort of emerging. Mm -hmm. And I realized that like human centered design and innovation was just like, super duper cool, super dynamic, super fast. Like I loved talking to people and learning what they needed and thinking about and talking about strategy. And so my first job out of design school was working as a design strategist and design researcher and just never looked back. And that's actually how I sort of got into facilitation was 
realizing that workshops were this incredibly important component mm. of the design thinking process. At the time, we weren't calling, we were just starting to call it design thinking. But it was like, okay, well, how do we get all of the stakeholders from the client side together and talk about what they really want out of this thing? And then how do we get all the customers together and get them to tell us what they really think? We realized, just started, you know, stealing and borrowing and absorbing different ways of getting that information out of people so that we could do the job of design. And you just mentioned, I think, twice the word power and politics. <laughs> so how did this experience impact you and your style of working and designing conversations? Well, I now prefer to try and level the power dynamics in the room. I think that's an important thing that a facilitator mm -hmm. does. But I think it's also important for a facilitator, if you're trying to actually get something done, you have to know what's going on inside of the organization. And honestly, big organizations are a mystery to me. It sort of blew my mind that we could be doing this big project, big for us, Meanwhile, they were paying two other agencies to do the exact same project. And then there was another vice president who was doing a competing project. I'm like, well, how are you all going to decide what gets done after this? Like, there were a whole host of conversations that I was not privy to about what was the real goal of this large organization. Mm -hmm. And once we could sort of peel back the layers and try to find out what was really going on, we could do something that was better, more worthwhile, more effective. And so I think understanding the power dynamics and the stakeholder connections is a really important part of the process of making things happen. So how would you react then in a situation if it happens to you today that you are hired by an organization and then you find out that actually there are two other parties that are doing exactly the same job as you do? <laughs> That's a really, I mean, I think that definitely still does happen. I think the difference is when I was working as a design consultant, I felt generally responsible for the creation of good ideas. Mm. Whereas now as a facilitator, I believe that it's their responsibility to generate ideas and it's my responsibility to create a space for them to have it. And I would probably just say like, oh, well, maybe we should have a conversation about the conversations that they're having and we should all come together. And it's great. I think diversity of thought is great. I understand why they're doing yeah. it. It seems like perfectly reasonable that if you have the resources, you should have multiple people thinking in multiple ways. But then the question is, how are we going to actually conglomerate them? How are we going to decide yeah. by what heuristics, by what measure will we decide which perspectives are good mm -hmm. or less good? And that conversation often doesn't happen. So I think what I would probably want to do is just invite people in to have that conversation together mm -hmm. to say, oh, well, this is what we're learning. Well, this is what we learned. And this is what we learned. You're like, okay, well, now what? Yeah, by creating transparency. And I guess that especially this tension that you might create, this slight conflict, it could also lead to a totally different path and new ideas if the conversation is designed or managed properly. Yeah, I think having uh, two really big conflicting viewpoints can be valuable if you share a large enough goal. If the goal is let's do the best thing, then the question is best how, mm -hmm. best for who, and then we can have that conversation. And that those are all totally reasonable mini conversations that are worth breaking out and say like, and I learned some of this from my conversation with my, uh, I went to the facilitation program at Harvard, which I don't know if you listened to that, podcast episode with uh, Bob Bordone, who I loved having my negotiation professor on my podcast. <laughs> and one of the big negotiation ta tactics or techniques I learned is that when somebody says, we should do X or, oh, I want to buy something for Y, you're like, oh, okay, that's really interesting. Where'd you get that number from? Or like, mm -hmm. oh, like, that's what you'd like to do. Like, cool. Like, tell me why. Like, lay it out for me. And it's great to then understand somebody's reasoning and somebody's goal And then occasionally, if you are asked enough questions, pretty much everybody's perspective is based on an opinion. Mm -hmm. And then that's great because it's fine to say like, okay, well, so this is your opinion. And your opinion is based on your expertise and your opinion is based on your experience. And hopefully some facts. <laughs> and hopefully some facts. And that can come out in the inquiry. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's still worth asking like, okay, so cool. 
Now I know this is your opinion and this is your opinion and this is your opinion. What now what? Now that we've opened the conversation now, mm-hmm. now we can, and we're exploring it, then we can say, well, how do we pick a shared criterion? It's the conversation about the conversation. That's and worth, delegate task of that. who's in charge of which part of the process. Yeah, yeah. Oh, potentially, yeah. Or does everyone need to be even responsible for or be part of every single part? Mm. And when I hear you speaking and the process of inquiry, I wonder where do you draw the line or is there actually a line between being a conversation designer, a facilitator, a moderator, and a coach? Wow. Yeah, or is it just one much. big thing that... It's just mushed all together? Well, so lately I've been wondering this question myself. And I have a, like a model that I've been using that I sort of smushed together from somebody else's models. And I can share, it's this quadrant of asking at the top and telling at the bottom. And Mm -hmm. on the left is problem and on the right is solutioning. Mm -hmm. And so the question is like, what quadrant do you need to be in when, Mm -hmm. right? And I generally try to be on the gentler quadrants, which are like asking people about the problem they're experiencing or asking them what the problem is like or asking them what solutions they've tried Mm -hmm. and and pushing them between those two quadrants. But sometimes you do need to go into the tell quadrants. Like if there's a fire or if there's somebody's choking, you're like, okay, everyone line up and get out of the door. Like sometimes you just need to tell people what to do and that's okay. And I think sometimes there's also a different definition of coaching. I've been looking at leadership models and some people think of coaching leadership as here, I'm going to tell you what to do and you'll do it along with me the way like a sports coach mm-hmm. coaches people. Mm-hmm. You're like, okay, do your backhand, do your front hand. But if you look at the inner game of tennis, I don't know if you've read that book. Did we, have we talked no, about that? No, no not yet. The, the inner game of tennis is like the, uh, an amazing book about coaching that's not about coaching. It's about like life. And it's not about tennis, but it's also about tennis. Like a very appropriate title for the book. <laughs> yeah, it's a wonderful book. It, the audio book goes really fast. And one of his perspectives is if I tell you exactly how to do your stroke, it can actually just make you self-conscious. Mm-hmm. and won't actually help you do your stroke any better. So the question is, how might I ask you a question so that I get the result I want? Mm-hmm. And so I would say, I will answer this question now, like a coach, I believe, is interested in the development of the person mm-hmm. that they're coaching, right? And so the question is, does the coach design their questions so that that person discovers for themselves, mm-hmm. does best practice, And in the inner game of tennis, he points out that revolutionary tennis players play differently. Every tennis player does not serve or uh, volley in the same way. For years, there was like, here's the way you do it. Mm -hmm. And then along comes Pete Sampras or, you know, someone else who does it in a way that they're like, that shouldn't work, but it does, right? Then it disrupts the game and the other person cannot adjust. Yeah, or, or, or somebody, and actually I just started reading Unlearned by my friend Barry, and he talks about Serena Williams in the beginning. You're going to hear all this flipping of pages on the recording yeah, I think now. it adds an extra. Yeah, yeah so she hit a wall apparently in her career at one point, and then she met somebody who had to re-coach her, and so she had to unlearn all these things. Mm-hmm. And so a coach, I think, is really focused on the individual. Mm-hmm but obviously you can be a group coach or a team coach. I I don't actually think there's very strong defendable definitions because a facilitator for me is somebody who the classic definition is there's this Latin word of facile, French-ish sort of word to facile, to make easy, Mm -hmm. right? Like make what easy? The decision, the discussion. The process. The process. And so a moderator moderates a discussion, Mm -hmm. right? To me, I think that's why conversation design is more interesting because the question is, where is the group now and where do they need to get to? And Mm -hmm. how do I design a series of conversations for them to get where they need to go? And the best example I can think of is like last night I was at the bar. I go out on Sunday nights with a group of people. I've been having dinner with them every Sunday for a couple of years, almost 10 years now. And there's 
my friend Miles is working on a brainstorm for a side project he's working on. Mm -hmm. And here's a really, really in the weeds difference between, okay, we want the two owners of this problem that we're bringing a group of people to brainstorm on. And we want to share some reasons why the project exists, the goals of the project, some insights they have about the domain space. And then they want people to have some initial ideas and responses to that. And I was like, that sounds like a lot of information you're throwing at them. Are you going to break that up a little bit? And that's based on <laughs> my own understanding of human psychology in the mm -hmm. same way that user experience design is like, okay, you know, that font isn't big enough or the button is too small. Somebody won't be able to actually touch it. Fits law. Like is the object large enough for somebody to touch based on the distance that they are away and the time they have to touch it. And so he was like, yeah, actually what I'm planning to do is do three short rounds of expert talks and then three short rounds of brainstorming after each prompt. And mm -hmm. I'm like, and then I'm going to have them get together in small groups and share things out. And I'm like, that sounds like that will work. Mm -hmm. The first way didn't sound like it would work based on psychology and my own understanding of group dynamics. Mm -hmm. Some people would say like, okay, well, let's get that whole group of like eight people and let's have everyone share out their ideas. And it's like, well, yes, you can. Do you want to give every person the same amount of time to mm -hmm. do it? Can we establish the rules ahead of time so that we know if people are quote unquote breaking them? Or should we have people share them in pairs and then pair up with another pair? Or should we have them do a template so that all their ideas look the same? Mm -hmm. Like, and then what? After they share their ideas, he was like, well, I kind of want them to do a business model canvas. And I'm like, why? He's like, well, I want to think about the launch strategy, but there's like half of the business model canvas isn't really relevant. And I'm like, well, don't use the business model canvas then. Here's the value proposition canvas. It's simpler, but you also don't have to use that. Just ask can, them the question you want to ask them. Or make your right? own template. <laughs> your or own make canvas. your own template. And Miles, who is a, an expert, at this stuff still needs a reflection partner mm -hmm. to think through the process of designing this conversation well because it's hard to design in a vacuum and so i was what was i doing there was i being a facilitator or a coach or a moderator of his mm -hmm. internal dialogue because miles yeah. has been having a conversation with himself for a while about this he and i've had other conversations about how to do it well and so to me designing the conversation is like what's the series of conversations, a series of prompts mm. and the groupings of sizes that can get the group to where they need to go. And then what happens? And I think it's especially difficult to design the workshop process or conversation process if you are interested yourself or if you are the owner of the problem. It is hard to get that distance. <clears throat> Because then you're so focused on the outcome and on the next steps that you tend, and I have observed that a couple of times, that you tend to forget to empathize with actually the group of participants, that they need a slower approach to actually first understand what the purpose is and to get them used maybe to the other groups of participants. Absolutely. I had a discussion with someone and she wanted to start a huge workshop with a fishbowl where you would have three people, three experts starting the fishbowl and having 150 people around them listening. I was like, that might be interesting at a later point in time, but if you do have 147 people not participating <laughs> in the conversation, and if this is the kickoff of the workshop, Maybe you want to get them involved slowly and first have connections and conversations in smaller groups. But so then this is based on your own model of a person because maybe those people are highly interested in what those experts have to say. And maybe that is the best way to get them slowly integrated into the problem. Mm. I always tell people when somebody shows me their agenda and they say, what do you think? Will this work? And I said, it might. Mm. You might it depends be able on the group of off. participants, obviously, and the and contact. It on the facilitator's commitment to, like, I sometimes push people through far too many activities really fast, and it tires me out, and it tires them out, but boy, was it, like, jam-packed, and are they really happy that they had a jam-packed session, mm. right? Versus, like, something like this, like, maybe it's important to slow it down, really up to them. 
I it's, it's do agree that putting some pressure and to put the participants in a pressure cooker, how do you call that in English? Um, yeah, that's how we call it. <laughs> oh, wow. Yep. It does help because have a clear time boxing, then you also don't get tired. If you just keep on running, you don't get tired. But I think in some circumstances, it's important to have everyone speak up at some point and to get involved in the conversation and also to have different personality types in mind. Yeah, I, I totally, totally agree. I was just the, the one of the workshops I was just working on. It's about training trainers. And there's, um, are you familiar with Knowles's principles of androgogy? Most people don't even know the word andragogy because it's a weird word. But pedagogy is the word we use about teaching people. Mm -hmm. But ped means child. Mm -hmm. And so his thing was like, well, what's andragogy, which is like a man or, or adult. Mm -hmm. And one of their principles is that adults need to be involved in the planning and evaluation of their instruction. And experience provides the best basis for learning activities. Mm -hmm. And that adults are interested in learning subjects that have immediate relevance and impact to their job or personal life. And that adult learning is problem-centered rather than content-centered. And those are four really good principles. And I think facilitation is a, is a group learning process. Mm -hmm. And so when I looked at those principles recently, I'm like, yeah, the, you're naturally using that when you're looking at what would make me focus on three people talking about this topic if this is the first time I'm being introduced to this topic. And yet many people are unwilling to or afraid of starting a, a workshop with why is this useful or interesting to you? Or what do you think about this? Because mm -hmm. they're like, oh, well, we have the experts here or, or I'm here to teach them what's important. So opening it up to the room is a different way of designing the conversation. It's, yeah total group centered versus center centered. Mm. And, but, I, but what I say is both can work. Both say something about the facilitator, both say something about the power dynamics or power structure in the room. Both could get you a result. They will get you different results. Yeah. Right. And I think the power dynamics in the room might be more important even than the preferences of the facilitator, because I think at the end of the day, it's my job to choose the most appropriate exercise for the group that I'm facing and their needs. Yes. And I think if there are large power differences, then it's important to start it slower to also give those the chance who might otherwise not speak up because then you face, otherwise you might face a leadership bias where everyone just follows the leader and agrees to whatever the experts in the panel at the beginning say, or oh. the next ones in the hierarchy jump in, or some overconfident intern jumps into the fishbowl. Yes. And that's designing the conversation to reduce that. Yeah. Yet you can over-design a conversation so that nothing happens. You know, I'm often very, very conscious of group dynamics and designing the group dynamics out of the process. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you want, it's helpful to have people seeding the group with ideas. Those first movers who either because of their gender or power perception for themselves or their just habitual approach to speaking will just say, hey, what if we do this? It can be helpful to just accelerate the conversation and maybe two or three people will get squished by that person. Mm -hmm. But for the sake of time, that group will at least have one idea, you know? <laughs> if the purpose is idea generation, yes. Yes, yeah, and speed, <laughs> right? If we're designing the conversation for speed and quantity of ideas, the question is like at some point we need to have some people come together mm. and speak first, right? So we can either decide ahead of time who that person is going to be or rock, paper, scissors it. But if you try to do everything, group decisioning, like, okay, <laughs> let's decide everything that's going to happen. Do I hear some irony in your voice? Oh, well, yeah, you could, over, you could over facilitate or it could take forever. You're like, okay, how should we make a decision? Okay, let's decide on how we're going to decide on how to make a decision. Before we continue the show, Let me take a brief moment to thank our sponsor, Session Lab. Are you using Excel or Word to prepare and schedule your workshops? Try something that is designed for facilitators. 
With an easy-to-use drag-and-drop agenda builder, Session Lab allows you to be free and creative in your workshop process design. Session Lab also comes with an immense built-in library of workshop activities and facilitation techniques to help you to find new inspiration for your sessions. Stop messing with spreadsheets and focus on designing engaging workshops. Try it as sessionlab.com. I wouldn't recommend it if I didn't believe in its value myself. So what's, according to you, the most effective way to take a decision with a large group? Oh, man. I mean, effective? That's a very provocative term. Because the decider is the most, autocracy is the easiest way. Mm -hmm. It is the most expedient way. Um, that's why all the, the, the design sprint people, um, actually, that's not true. The, the people who follow the Jake Knapp school of design sprinting use a decider because mm -hmm. the idea is like, let's hear from the group and then let's have the decider decide. And as long as uh, it's transparent, it's definitely... Yeah, that's efficient. But yeah. inside of Google, they have a flat organization and so there is no decider. They do it through consensus. And I think efficient affinity mapping dot voting, mm -hmm. uh, scoreboarding. There's a lot, like, I think, like you said, transparency, finding ways of making it transparent. Um, and I think if you start from a shared goal, and if you know that it is a true shared goal without hidden agendas, yes, then it's definitely also a process that has most probability or likelihood to survive in the future. Sure. Also, I would say you don't just like suddenly say, okay, let's decide. I think you pre-close, you narrow the funnel, and that makes it easier to, you know, you map the ideas in some way, shape, or form. Then you do a heat map of preferences. You do scoring on top of that. I think layering, mm -hmm. then it makes, then it sort of like backs people into, the, into it. And then the it job makes of it a facilitator. Easier. Yeah, and so exactly, the job of facilitators is to design that process so that it yeah. feels... What's easy about it, it feels gentle and inevitable. One question comes to my mind while discussing. To what extent do you believe does the facilitator has a responsibility to protect the group from, or the group decision from being kidnapped is a wrong word. Let's go with it. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so for instance, I imagine the situation where you have this workshop, where you have a group working focused together, coming up with ideas. And then in the last minute, the problem owner comes in and says, you know what? Nice to listen to you, but we'll make it differently. <laughs> How would you deal with such a situation? I mean, like we said, if there's a decider, that can happen. And that's okay. That's within their prerogative. Mm -hmm. It does make it really hard to expect people to be as generous with their creativity the second time. Yeah. And so when I teach facilitation to people, I think facilitative leadership is the willingness to step back and let others step forward mm -hmm. and to be clear about what hat you're putting on and taking off and to, and to understand what gets the most creativity out of people. It's okay to do that if people know that it's going to happen and are still giving their ideas in the spirit of this is not going to be what really happens. Mm -hmm. This is going to be something that will influence what really happens. Right. And that's just about level setting and communicating the process. It's hard. I've had that happen in my professional life where somebody's like, Nope, we're going to do it this other way now. Mm -hmm. and that, that's, that's not fun. Yeah. It's frustrating. And as you said, the next time, people will either not show up or not be as engaged. Reminds me of the Dan Ariely experiment with the legal houses, how he wants to show that we are most motivated when we see meaningful progress in our work. So if we see that yeah. the work we're providing will be disentangled at the end of it or ignored, then the next time we just don't want to engage and it's independent of money or any other financial yeah. incentive. Yeah, so I think that goes down to training the leader or the sponsor of the event. What is the key skill, according to you, since you're also teaching facilitating managers, what is the yeah. key skill that they should learn first? Sensing. 
I think if you don't know, if you can't feel what's happening in yourself and in the room, you can't know what's to do about Mm -hmm. it. Right. So the, I worked with a great facilitator who did an exercise where this question of how do you know that the energy in the room is flat? How do you, and we would just do like some brainstorming on this. How do you Mm -hmm. know that the energy in the room is dying? How do you know when it's increasing? And there's like visual signs Mm -hmm. that you pick up, but there's also like an energy in the room where you're like, Hey, it's cooking, right? This is, this is going. And so I think that, can you teach that? (laughs) Because it's a lot of intuition, right? Well, and I think there are people who are more sensitive to it and others who are just not. And I don't know whether it's self-awareness or empathy. God, I hope it can be taught. I really hope it can. It's tough because the people who come to these things are generally interested and have a growth mindset. I think if you're curious, Mm -hmm. like there are like, so, and I'll use a really weird example, which is like people who are on the neurological spectrum who maybe are, have Asperger's syndrome. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I have, and I have a good friend who I, who I went to high school with, who, who suffered from this, I don't know what the right way to to classify it is, but he had a hard time reading faces. Mm -hmm. He wasn't able to read emotion from faces. And that led to him actually getting beat up a couple of times in high school because like he didn't know when he was being annoying to people and pushing Mm -hmm. them too hard because he was just asking very simple questions and he just wanted to know what he wanted to know. He learned how to hack it later. He was able to develop a set of algorithms where he was like, oh, when somebody's brow goes below mm -hmm. here and this furrow means that they're tense and tense means anger. I would love to take a screenshot now. Yeah, yeah, sure. He's like literally (laughs) just drawing, he's using math Mm. and and graphs, which he's good at. And he's like, okay, so I'm going to chart this person's facial expressions over time. And he's like hacking it backwards to say like, I think they're getting tense with me. Yeah. And I think that for those who know that they struggle with these kind of things, it might be even easier than to, because as you just explained, they will find little hacks and little signs on how to read the room and how to translate it into their system. So I think breaking the problem down into smaller problems always helps people Mm -hmm. sense it. And that's one of the things that I've been trying to do with the book that I'm, I'm working on is taking this idea of, well, how do I shape this conversation and breaking it down into smaller pieces? Mm-hmm. But I think just giving people a thing to look for is like, oh, what's the body language like? What's happening? What are people's facial expressions? The thing that is hard to teach, you're absolutely right, Miriam, is self-perception. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big proponent of this now in my workshops is that if you literally don't know what you're feeling, it's hard to know Mm -hmm. what the group is feeling. But breaking the problem down into little pieces can help people do it, I think, I hope. Yeah, and then maybe it goes hand in hand. If you learn to read facial expressions more, you get an instant feedback also on how you're perceived and then maybe be more sensitive to it. Yeah. It's a process. Interesting. According to you, what makes a workshop fail? Well, so that's a really interesting question. And I think it's a question of like, what is the goal of the workshop? Right. Because I was just talking with a friend of mine who talked about a design sprint being a failure. And actually, Jake Knapp talks about this book. It's like, it's a failure if the users didn't like it. And it's like, well, actually, the truth is, the workshop, the sprint didn't fail, like, and the prototype mm-hmm. didn't fail either. The prototype probed the customer's perspective, and now we know more about it. And so, like, in that sense, like, what does fail mm-hmm. mean? Like, if a group of people came together and they walked away feeling like that was a colossal waste of my time, then it's a failure. Yeah. Right? If they felt like, wow, we didn't accomplish anything, we didn't learn anything, we didn't move the conversation forward, I wish that I hadn't taken that time out of my agenda. That's the only way that I think that it would fail. And I think the only way it can fail is if there isn't clarity of purpose, Mm -hmm. right? The main way it can fail is if it's not clear why we're there. And the other way it can fail is if we don't manage group dynamics. And if one person talks the whole time, i.e. 
the loudest person in the room or the facilitator if the facilitator talks all the time. <laughs> so I, I think that's, mm-hmm. that would be how it could fail is that if people didn't get out of it what they needed to. And mm-hmm. the only way that can happen is that if you don't spend the time to understand what the key goals are of the workshop. And I've done that before. I've definitely designed workshops where I thought they needed to go here. It was a very well-designed workshop for another group of people, right? And they actually, instead of going there, they, they really needed to go there. And At what point did you find out? At <laughs> the end. <laughs> of course. Well, it, you know, the, the ideas that came out of it were based off of the activity that happened before and the activity mm-hmm. before, and it was very progressive. And we started with the wrong prompts. We asked the wrong question, mm. right? So I think the way a workshop can fail is by asking the wrong questions and by not being clear on what the goals are. If you ask the right questions and you have the right series of activities that mm. get you there progressively, you'll get something, right? And they did get something. It's not like they got nothing out of it. It's just that the ideas were sort of like just, you know, in the vector model of things, like they could have just been more to the point. And then we ran it a second time with another group in the organization and revised the agenda significantly. I understood mm-hmm. the, the, the needs and the people and the goals a lot better. So like yeah. that's how workshops fail. If you don't understand the people and the goal and the right, the right series, it's, you're not going to get there. But that seems so so obvious. Like that's, that's it's foundational. It depends. I enjoy asking the question and just see what comes around because it often boils down to the same things. Obviously, the fundamentals. The fundamentals, yeah. But then you have some facilitators who would rather focus on the purpose, others more on the safe space mm. in the room um, or people dynamics. So it's interesting. So how much time do you usually spend on understanding the participants beforehand? It's really tough. I I know that there are some facilitators who would interview all of the participants. I do. Uh, Yeah. And I I don't always have the the bandwidth. Yeah, it depends on how many. So sometimes I will allow the sponsor of the workshop to sort of be the stand-in for that that. Mm -hmm group of people so because they are the sponsor they are the ones who are telling me where they really want to go and then i use the early stages of the workshop to understand what it is that they really to validate or invalidate their perspective and that the structure of the workshop is resilient enough Mm -hmm. generally good enough to allow minor shifts based on that understanding to bring it forward so would you change or adjust some exercises if you realize that there is, for instance, there are large power differences? And how would you do that? I Well, no, because I think, <laughs> I think I would generally build in for that in the first place. Like it's, I think that's just best practices because there's always going to be a power differential and there's always going to be somebody who's more willing to talk mm-hmm. and more people who are a little more reticent. So it's just about the size of the group and the mechanics of the workshop just have to be, just have to support that and the general goal. You know, the group sizes are designed to make sure that those group mechanics are accounted for. That's the most fundamental thing. I'm not going to try and manage a 15 person roundtable discussion to try and get to a point. I'm not that good of a facilitator. I mm-hmm. think there's some who are like, They're large person, large group facilitators, and they're, they'll just say, okay, we're just going to, the whole group is going to talk the whole time and we're going to get there. And I think that would be, that for me, that'd be very hard to not know. You would definitely want to know all the people in the room. Mm-hmm. You would definitely want to know what the power dynamics are in that case. But I think the group, breaking up the group and recombining the group allows an organic process of uh, clarity or group thinking to happen and so they get someplace they get to a place Mm. by the end of it based on the design of that conversation makes sense (laughs) good i'm glad i mean yeah because you cannot have a discussion with as you said 15 people i think even a discussion with six doesn't some people can though like i think a really good moderator can do that I'm more of a process based. I, I'm more interested in people patterns that make those types of conversations more 
more fluid and functional than and I, just managing that large circle. I think, again, it really depends on the purpose of the meeting. Yeah. So if the purpose is an exchange of information, but not necessarily idea generation or creativity, then it might make most sense. It actually makes most sense to have everyone together and to share this information. Yes, but absolutely. Want yeah. Everyone to contribute to a new idea or to challenge it, an existing idea, then maybe sitting with 15 people around a large table doesn't help a lot, even if you're a very good moderator. Yeah, well, it can certainly get bogged down. I'll, I'll yeah. say that. Yeah. You refer in your freebie to the conversation experience. Mm -hmm. In a previous podcast episode, we talked about experiences and how to create design experiences for, uh, within workshops in order because we all remember better when we felt and we feel through experiences or experiences yeah. trigger feelings. So I would be curious to hear how you define experience in the context of a conversation. I can do that. Experience design is actually really ephemeral to design because the question is, who is having the experience? And can I actually design an experience? I can't make them have an experience. John Kolko is probably the first guy who helped me understand that you can orchestrate experiences. You can design for experiences, but you can't actually design experiences. And there's another book that people should totally read, which is Setting the Table by Danny Meyer. It's the best book about experience design that's actually about food, everybody's actual favorite topic. And, his, and the title is about setting the table. You mm -hmm. can set the table for the experience. You can have the knife and the fork and the spoon. You can have the meals and the courses mm -hmm. come out at the right time, mm -hmm. but some people still have a crappy experience because they've had a bad day or because they're on a bad date. And so it's your job to orchestrate all the touch points so that the person gets what they need when they need it. Mm -hmm. And if the customer says to you, I'd like everything at one at the same time, then you go, cool, I will try, I won't course it out for you. And if they say like, no, we'd like this, then this and this, you're like, cool, then this. Mm. That's designing the experience with the person who's receiving it in mind. A workshop is an experience in that it has, like any other experience, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Mm -hmm. And there's an arc, and it's your job to shape that arc. It's interesting because when you mentioned setting the table, it, I love the analogy. And it made me think also of expectation management. So if mm. you're setting the table with Chinese and with these nice cutlery and nice glasses, and then you're served a frozen pizza. Well, you know, high level. will also shape your experience because you build up all these expectations. Yeah. And it's not consistent anymore. Right. And this is why I generally love to draw during workshops instead of having slides, mm. because it implies that we are having a organic, improvisational, fluid experience instead of a polished, perfect one. And you can apply the same rules to everyone that you say you don't use queens. And this applies to you as a facilitator as much as the participants. Completely legitimate. Absolutely mm -hmm. true. We are a little bit running out of time. And I don't want to let you go before hearing your favorite exercise, your silver bullet. Well, I mean, so those are two separate things, potentially. I wrote a book last year called The 32nd Elephant and the Paper Airplane Experiment. And mm -hmm. I've written about a bunch of those exercises online. And I, I did the book just to conglomerate them together. I think I don't like having to go to the shopping market before I want to teach somebody about something. So I personally don't like having to bring a bag of Legos or a bag of marshmallows and spaghetti with me to teach somebody something. <laughs> I get your point. Yeah. Like and so I have a background. I grew up doing origami as a kid. And so the second exercise in that book is the paper airplane experiment. It's very simple. I've written it up. The basic idea is to get a pair of people together to make a set of instructions on how to make a paper airplane. And that simple activity that takes about five minutes can be unpacked in a lot of different ways. I get people to think about first speaker syndrome, like How do groups, how does even a pair of people make a decision together, right? Who initiated the, the choice? Because they weren't even thinking about that. They were just like, oh, I have to make instructions. And then they get to also think about, well, how do I communicate my ideas to other people? And did I think about the functionality of 
the idea Tell and the idea. person who was going to be the recipient of this thing. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. all of these questions happen from this one five minutes. And then we can talk about prototyping and testing. Mm -hmm. We can talk about iteration and revision. And I can do it in 20 minutes or 30 minutes or 45 minutes. But the paper airplane experiment is a really fun exercise that gets people to focus on collaboration, visual communication, iteration, like literally everything about design thinking in like yeah. 30 minutes with nothing more than a piece of paper. And so I'm and a this might fan. also answer another question I had where you refer to eye openers instead of icebreakers. So yes. this paper yeah. airplane ex thing is yeah. an eye opener because people understand by doing that. Yeah, an icebreaker is just like, hey, let's throw around an invisible ball. Mm. But as soon as you say, what did it feel like to catch what somebody was throwing? Then you can say, oh, well, let, what can we learn about collaboration mm -hmm. from throwing an invisible ball? Communicating intentions and receiving intentions. You can do it with anything. Yeah. But an, an icebreaker is just like, okay, let's five, four, three, two, one, jump in the air. Cool, ice broken. Or <laughs> tell me two truths and a lie or whatever it is. That breaks the ice, but it has no functionality. Mm -hmm. so building the arc, it just gets people juiced up. It's like giving them chocolate. In my yeah. personal opinion, in Imho, in my humble opinion, I think giving somebody an exercise that connects them to each other and to the topic yes. and moves the conversation forward is, has more functionality. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> there could be so much... I generally agree. I think there are so many layers to that because it's also about creating. So an icebreaker is not only about pumping up energy, but it's also about sharing, about landing, about creating safe space, about. Yeah. <clears throat> but it's very common to see people focused on the ice breaking part and not on the connecting and landing and yeah. building part. Yeah. If someone fell asleep after minute one, just woke up and doesn't have time to listen to the entire show again. What do you want them to remember? Conversations matter. Conversations can be designed. It's somebody's job to do it when there's a lot on the line. And so being intentional about how you design them is worth doing. That's it. Wonderful. And if someone needs a conversation designer, how can they reach you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can find me at theconversationfactory.com. That's probably the easiest place. DanielStillman.com is less utilized, but those, those are the two places on the internet. They can tweet me at, at DA Stillman, and I will, I will respond to their conversation request immediately. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite conversation trigger? Trigger? trigger conversation trigger the one question or the one line that might trigger conversation in your private life oh how might we obviously that always works rose thornbud, rose thornbud is actually like almost my universal it's like it almost always works what's working mm -hmm. what's not working and what where are opportunities for growth or development rose thornbud is pretty handy Unfortunately, we're at the time where I literally have to go out the door. Yes. Otherwise, my client will be very yeah. sad with me. <laughs> I'm sorry you. for putting things. I sandwich. just put all the remaining questions in the last two minutes. I know, I'm like, thankful that you answered them all. <laughs> that's my pleasure. I really, really am excited awesome. to hear this in the world. I think you ask lovely questions. I Thank really you, appreciate Daniel. the time to reflect it was with you. Awesome talking to you. Thank awesome. you for making this happen. Yoo That's explosions. All right. Thanks. Sure there's a gift for that. <laughs> yes, there is. Bye bye. All right. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. Thank you for staying tuned and listening to the show. I appreciate your attention as I know how busy you are. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and engage by sharing your comments and thoughts and visit workshops.org to download the one page summary. I'm looking forward to seeing you back at the next episode and I wish you a fruitful day.